This video is all about the lore of Dota 2 found in other Valve games. So let's get on with it. But before I begin, I'll just say that I'm not too familiar or knowledgeable with any lore outside of Dota 2. When I researched other Valve games, I used their respective wikis as my source, as well as some videos on YouTube, instead of playing the games myself as I have yet to buy any of them, as well as some of the comics for Team Fortress 2 which is included in this video. So I apologize if I got some things wrong about another Valve game's lore. Now let's begin. The first snippet of Dota 2 lore that I found in other Valve games is in the famous multiplayer first-person shooter called Team Fortress 2. As shown in the blurbs for the fourth Scream Fortress event, it shows us how skilled Marasmus is with magic. And as we can see here, he is not very skilled for a magician. The blurb even goes so far as to say that Marasmus isn't a top-tier wizard since he only knows three spells, the two of them being very boring ones that he uses to read your cards. When you look at it closely, Erasmus' wizard abilities make a reference to the criteria of spellcasting abilities that's found in Rubik and Invoker's biography, with the latter's being a lot more detailed. I'll take an excerpt from both of these heroes' bios to tell you what I am talking about. Any mage can cast a spell or two, and a few may even study long enough to become a wizard only the most talented are allowed to be recognized as a magus. The greatest mages in those days were the ones blessed with the greatest memories, and yet so complex were the invocations that all wizards were forced to specialize. The most devoted might hope in a lifetime to have an adequate recollection of three spells, or at most. Ordinary wizards were content to know two it was not uncommon for a village mage to know only one, with even that requiring him to consult grimoires as an aid against forgetfulness on the rare occasions when he might be called to use it. To summarize these two excerpts, they give us a criteria. Average mages can only cast one or two spells, with them requiring mnemonics like spellbooks and grimoires to aid their memory and cast spells that they normally cannot cast with their limited memory. These mages are the lowest in the tier list, followed by very devoted mages who can learn only 3 to 4 spells in a lifetime. These mages are hardly the cream of the crop compared to those who are known as magus, who have excellent magical abilities, ranging from quick understanding and memorization of an enemy's spell to knowing more than the average amount of spells. So where does Marasmus fit in this criteria? Let's get back to the blurb for Scream Fortress. It says here that Marasmus is not a top tier wizard because he knows only 3 spells, with 2 of them used for guessing your card. We don't know what his third spell is, but that's not important for now. It even goes so far as to say that his magical incompetence is aided by the Bombonomicon and the Wheel of Fate, which casts his spells for him rather than doing it by himself with his own memory and power. Plus, most of the spells that he casts in gameplay are not from memory, such as the disarming spell that he found on the internet. We have you surrounded, at least from this side! <laughs> oh! Ah! Oh! Marasmus banishes your guns to the nether realms! Forever! Or perhaps only momentarily! Marasmus printed this spell off the internet! Not to mention that the spells that the mercenaries can cast are literally just pages of spellbooks that he found in his old storage. This pretty much tells us that Marasmus is not as talented as the likes of Rubik or Invoker, who both qualify as Amagus. Not to mention that the spells that the mercenaries can cast are literally just pages of spellbooks that he found in his old storage. This pretty much tells us that Marasmus is not as talented as the likes of Rubik or Invoker, who both qualify as Amagus. However, the statement that says he knows only 3 spells 
is contradicted by the amount of spells he shows in the comics and gameplay. Not counting the other spells that I previously mentioned before. Erasmus is surprisingly Magus material and on the level of Rubik and Invoker when you see how much magic he has. Not counting the spells from the Wheel of Fate and other magical items. This guy can cast many spells on his own, like a blast of fire, time travel portals, teleportation, shape-shifting healing, and so much more. But we're not here to determine whether the statement of Merasmus knowing only three spells is bogus or not. I just thought that it was cool that they referenced some of Dota 2's lore in another Valve game. I also felt like the word choice describing Merasmus as a wizard who is in top tier was specifically referring to something from Dota 2 lore. Anyways, it's a pretty cool reference. Let's get to the next one. The mysterious force known as Dark Energy doesn't just exist in Half-Life, but it's also in the lore of the Dark Seer, which is mentioned only once in his biography. At the last moment, just before capture, he crossed over and sealed the walls forever in an explosive release of dark energy. The context behind this excerpt is that he was escaping an army that outnumbered and destroyed his forces, save for himself, driving him to the maze between the walls where he trapped them in. Whether this dark energy in Dota 2 is the same as the dark energy in astronomy is unknown, but I think it's worth listing here. Besides, I do think that the Dark Seer's dark energy may be the same as the one in Astronomy, which in turn is the one that is used in Half-Life 2 by the Combine, ranging from their weapons to their structures. I believe that Ishkafel's dark energy is the same one found in Astronomy, and not just some energy that's simply called dark because it's characterized by darkness. I believe it to be so because dark energy contrasts gravity, the latter of which he can already manipulate with his first spell, Vacuum. Looking back at the quote, Darkseer's dark energy is described as an explosive release. This fits the nature of what dark energy is, because dark energy is responsible for the expansion of the universe. Dark energy is a force that permeates most of the universe and causes its expansion, which is countered by the force of gravity which causes stuff to collapse. Going back to Darkseer's lore, explosions are basically a kind of expansion, just like dark energy, so it's very likely that this dark energy is the same one found in cosmology and astronomy. Dark energy is also found in the Half-Life series, most especially in Half-Life 2, where the Combine is most prominent. Dark energy is used by the Combine as a powerful resource that suits almost all of their needs. It powers the Citadel and its technology, as well as providing devastating ammunition for their weapons. One can tell that this is dark energy because of the effects on live targets. When a victim comes into contact with an orb of dark energy, they will be disintegrated and float above the ground. They begin to float because of its contrasting effect against gravity causing them to defy gravity once they touch this dark energy. Besides the both of them having properties that defy gravity, both of these depictions of dark energy are related to interdimensional travel. Darkseer used dark energy to seal the walls that separated the main Dota 2 universe from the maze between realities. It's interesting how he managed to close something by doing something that makes more space rather than something that closes space and distance. It's possible that he was able to close the wall by expanding it, because this wall that he interacted with wasn't an ordinary wall. Said wall is described as a prismatic wall of warping light, according to the lore of Iron Shell and his wall of replica. This prismatic wall is what divides our reality from the maze that lies between our reality and Darkseer's home reality. When the Dark Seer slices holes into this wall, it causes prismatic energy to seep forth from his home realm. I'm not going to delve deep into physics to understand what dark energy has to do with a prismatic wall of warping light that isolates our reality from the maze between worlds and Dark Seer's home realm. 
but I guess that's just food for your thought. The Combine, on the other hand, uses dark energy to power their technology. Besides their weapons that I already mentioned, they use dark energy to power the technology responsible for their teleportation. They come in the form of these orbs that power the Citadel's tunneling entanglement device. Oh my god. This is the Citadel's dark fusion reactor. It powers their tunneling entanglement device. I'm not going to go too in-depth on what tunneling entanglement means, but in Half-Life 2, this device was used to open a portal for Dr. Wallace Breen to teleport into the Combine Overworld. While Breen is traveling between this universe and the Combine Overworld, the universe that he leaves behind will be destroyed in a singularity. He states that the Citadel will be coated in unnamed and deadly particles, possibly being the cause of its self-destruction. Dr. Freeman, you really shouldn't be out there. At the moment of synapse, as I teleport, this chamber will be bathed in deadly particles that have yet to be named by human science. Perhaps when I have the leisure to do the work myself, I'll name one of them after you. That way you won't be completely forgotten. When the singularity collapses, I'll be far away from here, in another universe as a matter of fact. You, on the other hand, will be destroyed in every way it is possible to be destroyed, and even in some which are essentially impossible. With that being said, it's now clear that dark energy is a key ingredient, if not the sole ingredient, for teleportation between universes. After crossing the dimensional walls to the main Dota 2 universe, Dark Seer used this dark energy to close the walls of his home universe and the Dota 2 universe forever, sealing the enemy army that was now trapped in the maze between realities. On the other hand, dark energy is used by the Combine to power their tunneling entanglement device, which allows for teleportation between the main Half-Life universe and the Combine overworld, which is also another universe. By the way, while we're still talking about Darkseer, there's a cool detail in this immortal item the Bracers of Forlorn Precipice. The shape that appears and replaces his default iron shell is actually a convex regular icosahedron, a three-dimensional shape with 20 faces. This is the same shape of the G-Man's prison in the Combine Vault in Half-Life Alyx. For now, this similarity does not have any significant meaning, but given that they were both designed by Valve, I'm inclined to believe that this is no mere coincidence and it might imply something in the future. Half-Life 2's famous garden gnome, named Gnome Chomsky, can be found in the card art for the Radiant and Dire Creeps in Artifact. An interesting detail to notice is that these gnomes have their respective ancients' aesthetics. Between factions, the only difference that these gnomes have are the color of their eyes and the color of their hats. The Radiant Gnome takes after the Radiant Creeps. They have green hats, and their eyes glow blue. This also applies to the Dire Gnome. Their hat is red, and their eyes glow yellow. They also have the added detail of having a carved line across their hat, just like the Dire Creeps masks. This seems to be a very small reference to another game that has no significance to the lore whatsoever. But it's interesting that they added the effort of making them look like they're warped by their respective ancients, rather than just putting them in completely unaltered as an insignificant easter egg that does nothing but entertain those who take the time off to find it. Most would say that this has no significance, but I do hope that it has more meaning to it. I hope that this implies some sort of relationship between the worlds of Half-Life and Dota 2 because it would be really cool to see a canon crossover between these two continuities that have compatible lore with each other. Anyways, this similarity is not as big as the next one that I'm about to present. Did you know that the Outworld has a lot of similarities with Half-Life Zen? Let me list their similarities. Just like Zen, both of these realms have crystals both of these crystals can manipulate space-time to some extent. 
Let's start with the Outworld's crystals. The Outworld is implied to be a celestial body that houses a special kind of crystal that looks similar to the stone that covers the destroyer's body. We don't know much about these crystals, besides the fact that they produce lots of magical energy, allowing the destroyer to use them to replenish his mana. These crystals can be used to banish people into an astral prison. Rupturing these crystals causes it to unleash a blast of powerful energy that can be felt interdimensionally. The explosion from an outward crystal can be felt between dimensions. Whether these dimensions mean different planes of existence, a multiverse, or literal dimensions like the three dimensions of space is unknown. But either way, its power can be felt between dimensions. These crystals, stated to be the embodiments of the void, can also be used to teleport and imprison people into an astral prison. Said prison is located in the same void that the destroyer patrols in his lore. To the outer dark. To the place of darkness. To the abyss. On the other hand, Zen crystals, also known as Zenium, are used to cause a quantum event called the Resonance Cascade. It's stated that these crystals have a negative mass and they possess a high enough resonance to cause a resonance cascade when vibrated at the right frequency by an anti-mass spectrometer, a device that was meant to study things with negative mass as the name implies. Physics aside, this crystal was the cause of a resonance cascade, an event where many portals leading to the world of Zen opened on planet Earth, warping space and time to cause many things from Zen to teleport to and fro between their homeworld and our world. Eventually, this led to the interdimensional force of the Combine to exploit this event, allowing them to travel into the world that we live in and conquered it in mere 7 hours. In layman's terms, these crystals allowed for teleportation between Earth and Zen by dimensional rifts, also known as portals. What they also have in common is their connection to the multiverse, as well as their status as a border world. Once again, I'll be starting with the Outworld. I believe that the Outworld is a border world because of its other name, the World on the Rim. It got its name because the Outworld is located on the edge of the Void, also referred to as the Rim of the Abyss. Hence, it exists on the border between our world and the Void. As for the connection of the Outworld to the multiverse, there's so much proof that implies that the Void it is related to is also the multiverse. The best proof comes from the first event of Aghanim's Labyrinth. When Aghanim uses his spells during battle, he has this to say, With power from beyond the void! So what does this mean? He's basically saying that his powers are sourced from beyond the void itself. Given the context of the event, however, the only place that he has been to is the astral plane, which is home to countless dimensions with dimensions referring to parallel universes, rather than dimensions like height and width. Given that he's only been to the astral plane during this event, it's safe to say that the void that Aghanim is referring to is also the astral plane. And I don't think the void that he is referring to is a different place from the astral plane because of the next evidence. But this by itself is very weak evidence. Let me present some stronger ones especially ones that are related to the Outworld Destroyer. What all the next evidence have in common is that everything that is related to the Void is described with the adjective Astral. This is very important because the Astral Plane is the multiverse as we have learned in Aghanim's Labyrinth. And if the Void is Astral in nature, then the Void also has the multiverse because the Void and the Astral Plane are one and the same. Let's get to the first evidence. Most of the Outworld Destroyer's lore makes reference to multiple dimensions, two words that are commonly heard when talking about the multiverse. When Snapfire kills him, she states that she's unsure if he's dead because he's pan-dimensional. Tell the truth, I'm not even sure he's really dead. What if he's pan-dimensional? The takeaway of this voice line is the possibility of the Outworld Destroyer being pan-dimensional. The word pan-dimensional means pertaining to all dimensions of reality, a 
according to the dictionary. Since this adjective applies to his existence, then this means that he exists across all dimensions at once, and that Snapfire would have to kill him in all dimensions of reality to really stop him. <laughs> Damn you sons of bitches! Of course, this statement is unreliable because Snapfire knows little about the cosmos and the metaphysical stuff. But it's interesting that the Valve writers made her say that specific oddity to the Destroyer. One of his abilities is called Astral Imprisonment. The lore states that this ability banishes and imprisons his victims to the pocket between this world and the outworld. According to his responses, this pocket is actually the same void or abyss mentioned in his biography. This is also confirmed in the lore of his astral imprisonment card in Artifact. For me, the void is a place of reflection and peace, but to my enemies, it is a realm of inscrutable horror. So what does all this have to do with the relationship of the Outworld to the multiverse? First, the imprisonment of a victim into the void is astral in nature, which is why it is called astral imprisonment. If banishing someone to the abyss is astral in nature, then the void might be related to the astral plane, which has a multiverse full of countless dimensions. Let me make the relationship with the Void and the Multiverse even stronger. According to Void Spirit, the Void has infinite possibilities. These infinite possibilities are very synonymous with the Multiverse, since it's also composed of infinite futures where you decided to take a certain path, hence the possibilities of you doing something in the future. Embrace the infinite possibilities of the Void. Void Spirit also mentions that the Void is a mirror, but he says nothing else about that. The Void is a mirror. The Void being a mirror is another characteristic shared by the Astral Plane. According to the lore of the Devourling, Astral experiences always involve a strange reflection of the self, an oddly distorted quintessence that is never far from hand. This seems to imply that experiences in the Astral Plane and reveal a reflection of yourself, just like a mirror. It's possible that these reflections are actually a different version of yourself from another universe, but I'll expand that in another video. The point is, the outworld is related to the multiverse because of its connection to the void, and the void has a multiverse because it shares many characteristics with the astral plane. Both of them have infinite possibilities or dimensions and both of them are mirrors that can display strange reflections of the self. Let's get to the world of Zen. Zen is referred to as a border world by the G-Man in the first Half-Life game, during the moment when he meets Gordon Freeman near the end of the game. The border world, Zen, is in our control for the time being, thanks to you. Quite a nasty piece of work you managed over there. I am impressed. According to Valve writer Mark Laidlaw, Zen is a dimensional transit bottleneck, an area of continual contention. What he meant by an area of continual contention is that Zen is always being fought over by multiple sides, such as the G-Man who seeks to control this place presumably for his employers, and the Nyland who retreated to this place and controlled it after it was pushed back to Zen by the Combine after said army conquered the Nyland's homeworld. It could also be a place of continual contention because of the fierce competition between its non-native wildlife. After all, Laidlaw says that nothing in this realm is native to Zen, so I assume that with all that alien wildlife that's unfamiliar with each other, it would be like a normal ecosystem where wild animals meet each other with hostility for the sake of self-defense, unfamiliarity, or just for hunting. As for what Laidlaw meant by Zen being a dimensional transit bottleneck, I think there are multiple interpretations to this. Two interpretations, at the very least. Before I do that though, 
Let's define these two words, transit and bottleneck, so that you can understand my interpretation. Transit has several meanings, but what they all have in common is that they are the movement of anything, including people and objects from one place to another. A bottleneck is a metaphor for an impasse where there are too many things blocking a passage, hence the word border world. But a bottleneck can also be a metaphor for a traffic jam, which might refer to the many immigrant species from alien dimensions that are clumped up in Zen. That being said, Zen is also related to the multiverse just like the outworld, but in its own unique way. While the outworld can access the multiverse through the void that it is situated in, Zen is related to the multiverse because the realm itself is a nexus for multiple dimensions. According to Laidlaw, Zen is a meeting place, a point where universes collided and hung in endless freefall, with the elements of countless worlds intermingled. Going further into his description, he states that Zen is a way station, essential to all travel that takes us out of this universe and into the next. Whoever controls Zen controls all the worlds. And what he meant by worlds is not a planet or any inhabitable celestial body, but rather entire realities. This could actually be the real meaning behind its border world title, since it's a border between every reality, like lines making a grid. And crossing this border allows you to get into any reality that you may or may not choose. To summarize, both Outworld and Zen have many similarities. First, they both have crystals that can have a significant effect on space-time. Since Outworld crystals can release cataclysmic energies when ruptured, which can be felt interdimensionally. With proof that the Outworld is related to the multiverse, it's possible that interdimensionally refers to parallel universes rather than other kinds of dimensions. On the other hand, Xenium must be vibrated at the right frequency to create rifts in space-time that allows for teleportation. So I think the main takeaway of all this is that whoever wrote the lore of the Outworld was very much inspired by Half-Life Zen, and that we can draw so many parallels between the Outworld and Zen because of that. After all, one of the former writers of Dota 2, Mark Laidlaw, also worked on the Half-Life series except for Alex, so it's not a surprise that he'd carry over stuff between Valve games. When I first saw these similarities, I thought that there were very cool discoveries. I also thought initially that this could imply some sort of crossover between Valve games, because the lore between these games is quite harmonious with each other. Like the references that I mentioned in this video, there are many lore elements that are shared between continuities. Dota 2 and Half-Life lore could exist in the same universe and still make some sense, because they share lots of themes in common such as science and metaphysics. It's obvious that Half-Life doesn't have Dota 2's magics, but they do have the supernatural beyond science in the form of the Vorticons and their Vortessens, the Combine Advisors, and possibly the Nihilant. Speaking of crossovers, I'll be cooking up another video that has something to do with crossovers. Until then, I'll be seeing you all in the next video.